Tēnā koutou katoa, nga mai hāri mai. Ko Cameron Lowe tōko ingoa, ko au te kai tono pōtu, kai rohi pōti mō te pitamata ki tēnei rohi. Hi everyone and welcome, I'm Cameron Lord. I am your top candidate for Mount Albert. Uh, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that today the country farewelled Constable Matthew Hunt. I know many of us will be very saddened by this and I don't think that there's anything really that I can add to that, that that's meaningful other than to uh, pay my respect to that man and his family and his friends and his colleagues. Uh, we have a top roadshow event uh, for Mount Albert in, uh, at the YMCA by Rocket Park on Tuesday coming up. Uh, I will be there along with our Deputy Leader Shine Abort. Uh, I'll also be at the Grayland Farmers Market here on Sunday so uh, come along and meet me there or meet me here, come and talk to me. Uh, but tonight I'm very pleased that the evening is not about me, it is about the universal basic income. Uh, there's toilets around to the left and there's toilets at the back. Uh, go downstairs and outside in the event of an emergency or downstairs and inside in the event that you are thirsty. I'm going to hand over now to TOPS Deputy Leader Shine Abort for this evening's presentation on UBI. Ladies and gentlemen, Shine Abort. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Especially, I've seen some of your faces already this week, so thank you so much for your interest in TOP and what we're trying to achieve here for New Zealand. Tonight is about a universal basic income. For us, that's $250 in your pocket every week, no questions asked, yours to keep and spend how you like. We have a number of speakers this evening, and if I ask that you take away one thing, it's that a universal basic income is not an idea just for the right, and it's not an idea just for the left, because it achieves many different policy objectives when it comes to our tax and welfare system. It is about as apolitical a policy can get. So first of all, I would like to welcome this evening a, uh, a man who is most famous, though you won't know it, for creating the term universal basic income in the first place. Keith Rankin is here with us this evening. He is an economic historian, has been an economics lecturer for 20 years, just retired at the start of this, bit more than that, sorry. Um, Sorry, I was at Unitech teaching it just for 20 years alone. And uh, has been writing about this topic since at least 1991. And so what better man to start the evening than Keith Rankin. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you for inviting me here today to talk about universal basic income. So yes, uh, I coined the term in 1991 when I wrote a paper um, originally for um, a guy from, called Bill Jordan from UK was down um, and he was the um, best known person or the person representing citizens income um, group in the United Kingdom. And um, there was a one day symposium in Hamilton in 1991 uh, calling for papers and I saw the uh, thing there but I couldn't go that day so I wrote a paper anyway someone else presented it for me but it, it got um, a lot of people thought this was the best paper there even though I didn't present it and it was called uh, universal basic income in the context of the universal welfare state and so um, the in the UK they called it citizens income and Europe they were calling it basic income uh, but I decided because it was the universal welfare state I wanted to write about so I called it universal basic income and that seems to be a name that seems to have stuck even though there are other names. 
I wrote a bit and I was on national radio and, and a lot of people wrote and that was the time of very high unemployment in the early 1990s. And the, the, the idea took off quite a bit then and in the 1990s, but later in the 2000s it kind of died off a little bit and then after the global financial crisis, I think the interest in universal ba basic income picked up again after that. Um, in the meantime, various different people have different ideas. I was invited to speak in the um, Congress in Vienna for the Basic Income European Network, and I was on a panel discussion with people from the different continents, all there, and talking about universal basic income. And it was after that that some of the Europeans started using the term. So they had never used it before, but they seemed to like the name, and so they started using it. So. Um, you started to see it in the, lit in the literature um, from 1999-2000. Uh, Philip Van Paris was the one I'm thinking of in particular. So that's the, where the, when the term became widely used in, in a wider sense. But in terms of what I wanted to write, it's always understood as a mechanism. And it, uh, just like a negative income tax is a, is a similar related concept, and it's a, a mechanism. And so basically, we had um, um, the flat tax proposals, and, uh, w which almost came through as flat tax, but it was nearly flat tax as it came through. And so um, looking at the graduated tax scales and how they had sort of flattened over time, I'd looked at the Labour Party reforms in the early 1970s, which partly flattened the tax and gave a personal tax rebate. And, and I thought about, well, Roger Douglas, he wants this very low flat tax, but what say the flat tax was higher, like in the 30s or, dare I say it, even the 40s? And of course, when you have a graduated tax scale, it means that basically you have a benefit that is kind of hidden in the tax scale. And that's always been the case ever since income tax has existed, because you look at just about any other country in the world, they've got tax e income tax exemptions and income tax allowances. So it means that everybody who is paying income tax receives some kind of benefit, and, and unless it is a flat tax, because they're getting the concession or whatever from those concessionary rates. And so uh, if you then think of, um, in the New Zealand context today, we think of 33% tax. If you then just work out the tax benefits associated with the lower tax scale, the, the lower tax rates, and add them all up, it adds up at present to $9,080 a year, which is $175 a week. So um, the proposal that uh, using the Occam's razor principle that it's simplest is often best, uh, let's go with what we've got, 33% tax rate and uh, universal basic income, for want of another name, of $9,080 a year, $175 a week. And recently, that was almost exactly what student allowances were, what the unemployment benefit for people aged 20 to 25 was, 18 to 25. I think it's gone up a little bit above that now. So that was the simple idea that I was promoting. We used the, um, the benefit drawn out of the tax system, flat tax of 33 cents. And so we had a mechanism. So you had the flat tax and the benefit that came from it. But um, and in New Zealand, anyone earning more than $70,000 a year already gets their universal basic income because they get the full amount of that benefit. Anyone earning, say, $50,000 a year gets uh, about 8500 So that's almost the 9000 but not quite. Uh, if you earn $0, you get nothing. And that's always been the problem with benefits that come through the, tax, the income tax system. You have to be paying income tax to get the benefit. And so, in effect, they are regressive benefits, uh, meaning that uh, the more you earn, the higher the benefit you get. So all of the allowances and exemptions and that, um, uh, you, to get the full benefit, you've got to be earning so much. And the new one of that type is the KiwiSaver one. You know, we get $521 a year if you earn enough. If you don't earn enough, you only get part of it. If you don't earn anything, you don't get any of it. So that's the um, uh, example of a benefit through the tax system that you get more the more you earn. 
whereas the general benefit system, the idea of social security is that social security benefits for the needy and through means testing and other means they bleed out as you earn more. So in other words, you've got two types of benefits. One type, you, the benefit's higher the more you earn. The other type, the benefit is lower the more you earn. So there's an obvious way of bringing the two together to create a system where you don't, um, it's, it's, it's all much flatter and it conforms with general equity principles. So horizontal equity, treating everybody the same. So if you have a flat rate of tax of 33 or some other rate of tax, everybody's treated the same. You have a benefit, a universal basic income, 175 or whatever other number, everyone's treated the same. If it's treated from a purely tax point of view, it's still a progressive tax, because if you treat it as a tax rebate and you, um, you deduct that from um, um, the, the tax you pay and then work out your average tax, then it's a very nicely progressive system. However, I think it's more useful to regard that uh, basic income as, as something more than a tax credit, as an actual uh, kind of benefit, and the kind of benefit that is most useful is to think of it as something more like a dividend, which is what it is, because it is a dividend uh, that everybody gets, that everybody who's uh, really the adult gets anyway, and so it's a dividend of the um, economic cake. And in particular, if we're thinking of dividends, we're thinking of business, we're thinking of equity, and it means that we're thinking of it as being a capital income. So we actually, as well as giving it a name, we can give it a, a meaning as a form of benefit that is like a business dividend, but it's an equity dividend because it is collective equity divided between us all. And so um, I've been, in my more recent writing, I've been talking about a public equity dividend to emphasize that this is a something that we can connect to the economy and, and justify what it is and that it's, a, it's linked to business rather than to welfare course linked to the economy rather than to welfare. So it's an economic dividend. Okay. I get a bit closer. Cool. So, um, so we've got a mechanism, we've got a flat tax and we've got an associated benefit, a dividend benefit, and then we've got the idea of social capital or collective capital, and so you think of the whole, uh, what makes us really the rich people rich in a rich country and not so rich in other countries, well, it's a richer country, the higher productivity country, so you can think of it as a productivity dividend, so it should be higher and higher productivity countries. And so what makes um, us more productive in New Zealand than in, say, Ukraine? Well, we have a higher GDP per capita. It's not just because we work harder, we put more effort into our work. Much of it is it's our institutions, our environment, our climate, our infrastructure, and all of nature. Water, who owns water? Instead of saying nobody owns water, everybody owns water. And then we can think of it as, uh, as that as part of the uh, collective capital and that, that um, uh, basic income becomes a dividend based on that. All right, so um, now in terms of, uh, I saw the thing, what would it mean for you in terms of what I would like to do is to keep it as simple as possible, but to just make sure that we are dealing with the objections that other people pose when they all say, uh, unaffordable, and it's a license to, um, license to leisure, license to laziness or whatever. Um, and a again, it depends on the kind of proposal that you have. If you, uh, if, if you want a very, very high, universal basic income, then it becomes an alternative, it becomes something that you can choose not to work, should you wish, but that has to be some very high level, which would have to be matched by a very high tax rate, and it's certainly not what I'm advocating. By advocating basically what we already have now, it means that nobody is worse off, but it's in, in order to fill out the cracks because of um, people on lower incomes getting less. So it's a, a process of 
um, of accounting, of, of reaccounting and refilling, refilling the cracks. So um, if we think of how what I would like to happen is the best in the top process, this is what I would like to see happen now, is that we just simply do exactly as I said, but for people who are earning less than seventy thousand dollars a year, they should be top up. So that someone earning fifty thousand dollars a year should get one hundred and seventy five and not the hundred and fifty or whatever it is that they get now. Um, Look at existing beneficiaries. Well, existing beneficiaries, um, so long as they get more than $175 a week, you can get the first $175 is UBI, and they're transferred here by the list. So someone who is a beneficiary receiving, say, about $400 a week in total, the first $175 is universal, unconditional, and it means that when their circumstances change, when they go in, and do um, uh, other things, you are not penalised uh, when you want to move into the workforce, when you get some part-time work, you get um, some uh, short-term contracts and things like that, you can keep your basic income. And if you're a university student or a tertiary student, then you have that as effectively your student allowance. Um, that is based on the principle of horizontal equity, um, and the other principle is vertical equity, where, where people need help, where people have different needs, you're able to meet it. So my proposal doesn't abolish anything at all. All it does is reaccount, so changing the way we, we think about what we already have, and it um, fills in those cracks. And where do the cracks fall? Mostly lower income working people. So what the um, public equity dividend does is something we can all own. It's the same for beneficiaries, the same for rich people, the same for workers of all salary groups. So um, they take it with them. Okay, and, um, and now the other thing that's a problem that's noticeable now in these days of COVID-19 is that a lot of people are losing jobs for reasons that are beyond their own control and so on. But when you get a benefit that is linked to your um, to your income, you lose your income, you lose your benefit as well. And that's completely the opposite of what benefits are supposed to be for. Benefits are supposed to be able to support you when something else goes wrong. So the way we can think of it is that the public equity benefit or universal basic income is an income stream that comes from the public side of the capitalist economy. And then your wage is a private income stream that comes from what you do. Or if you're in business, you're making profits, or if you're earning money from shares, you're getting an income stream from that. But it means that we can think when we, you know, someone earning $70,000 a year, they get 33% uh, tax, and then they get their basic income of 175, so they've got one stream, the 175, the rest is their private stream. So by having those two, it means that when one of them uh, falls, the other is still there. <laughs> so it means you're always, you have the cushion when you fall because of circumstances such as what we've been facing recently rather than having the cushion pulled from under you as you fall, which is what we don't want to have. So in terms of who benefits and how much, from my proposal, if we look at it just in straight numbers today, most people would get exactly the same amount of dollars as they do today. <laughs> the only difference would be the way it's written up on your pay slip or on your benefit form. But the peop some of the people in the middle would get more because they are low income workers, and that would be topped up. The other groups uh, that, um, that's important to note is the group that I call private beneficiaries. Now the two main groups of private beneficiaries are P 
people who are partnered. So you have a partner, you may not qualify for a benefit even if you're unemployed because your partner's employed. The other group is students who um, are dependent on their parents until they're age 24, or at least that's the official line, is that you cannot get a student allowance unless you meet a means test. Otherwise, in principle, your parents are meant to pay for you. So those students whose parents are paying for them when they're 22, 23, 24, they are also private beneficiaries. In practice, what they do is take out a student loan if the parents don't pay that benefit. So what it effectively means is that the living allowance of a student loan would become the student allowance, would become a universal basic income. So, um, so, and those partners would get the universal basic income too. So that, um, uh, if your partner is working and you are not, you get it. So you're a private beneficiary now, your partner pays you the benefit, now you get that 175 or 250 or whatever it is from the government, um, from public finances. And one final point I'll make is that even though uh, under in terms of strict, strict monetary circumstances, no one is worse off and a few people in the middle are better off, but in another sense, everyone is better off. And that is because if you are on a high income, you might not be on a high income next year. <laughs> so you're better off knowing that if your income is under pressure that you have got that, 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 that basic income still there. You don't have to apply for it. No bureaucracy, it is there. And if you are um, a, a beneficiary, you don't get any more because it's only the first part of your benefit is a universal basic income. The rest of it is still your benefit. But when you cease to be a beneficiary, you've still got that part, part that's there. So either way, as you move, so it's the middle that's most disadvantaged at the moment. And you can move to the middle from the top, or you can move to the middle from the bottom. But it's that moving to the middle, which is the most precarious thing, whether you are a high earner or whether you are a beneficiary, moving into that middle ground. And that's where the um, knowing that you have that there means that you are unafraid of moving into the middle. <laughs> and that's, I guess, where I'll finish. Okay. Uh, thank you, Keith. And we will definitely have some questions for you uh, at the end. Um, so we have asked some people uh, to share their stories of what a UBI would mean for them. So over the course of this evening, we're going to play just a few of those for you. And I think Kane maybe has two ready to play for you. Just I study media. I study media design for <laughs> two years, and while I was studying, $250 would mean the world to me. I would not have to worry about food every week. I was eating uh, ramen noodles three times, four times a day, barely eating any meat, and my diet was just appalling because having expensive rent and not being able to get student allowance meant that all of the loan would go straight to my um rent and I didn't have any excess for food. The $250 would mean that I'd be able to feed myself properly with proper well-balanced meals and have a little bit of extra to be able to do the social life things and have a balanced life as well as a balanced diet. I'm 
a student full time at Massey University. I'm studying nursing and I also work at Fork and Brewer as one of the duty managers and run shifts here. Um, $250 a week for me would mean that I wouldn't have to worry about rent. Um, it would cover my whole rent for the week, which would be amazing. And I think with everything that's going on with all the COVID and everything, it's really important to support local and it would give me the opportunity to do that. I feel like it's quite expensive going out and eating in places, you know, <laughs> especially places that pay living wage. And I think it's really important to support that working in hospital myself. So it would give me the opportunity to be able to spend some extra money on stuff like that. Plus help, help out with community. Awesome. Thank you. That's okay. Hopefully you can just hear me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so next up we are welcoming oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So much admin. Um so next up I would like to welcome Don Brash, who I'm sure many of you will know. He was the former governor of the Reserve Bank for almost fourteen years and a former leader of the National Party and still in uh, economic and financial policy advisor, so I would like to welcome Don Brash to the stage. <laughs> thank you, up and down, like a yo-yo. Uh, thank you very much, I'm delighted to be here. I appreciate the welcome. Uh, I am not gonna speak in detail about the UBI, but I wanted to talk about a dilemma which I faced when I was in fact leading the National Party. At that point, we had uh, six figures unemployment substantial number of people on benefit. And it seemed to me there were two reasons for that. Partly, there were some people who simply were not worth hiring at the then minimum wage. They didn't have literacy. I was talking to managers who said, I am looking for an, a, a, a forklift truck driver, and I cannot find people who can read the pallet labels well enough to be a truck lift, uh, forklift truck driver. So the people who simply weren't worth hiring at the minimum wage. And the other side, uh, you found people on benefit who face a very high effective tax rate to get off a benefit. We think of the high tax rates, or many people in the middle class anyway, think of a high tax rate as people who get to 33% when they get to 70,000. But the really high tax rates are not at 70,000, the really high tax rates face people who are on a benefit. If they want to get off that benefit, they lose the benefit, they start paying tax, they start losing accommodation supplement, and they face a very high effective marginal tax rate. Add to it the cost of childcare, cost of transport, cost of extra clothing, etc. And people say, why should I bother? And they're making a perfectly rational decision to stay on a benefit. Uh, at that time, I asked the Parliamentary Library to give me some figures, and they pointed out there were 20, more than 25,000 single parents in 2006 who faced an effective marginal tax rate of above 95%. Unsurprisingly, they didn't get off the benefit. It was simply not worth their while doing. So Lockwood Smith and I, actually at that time, Lockwood spent a lot of time trying to work out how to deal with that, and it is a difficult technical issue. And the most effective way, I think, is some kind of universal basic income. And what, I, I came across an Australian economist, actually New Zealand-born Australian economist, by the name of John Humphreys, and he came up with a proposal for Australia, which was actually fiscally neutral, didn't require any additional tax, uh, didn't require any less tax, but it, it was roughly neutral as compared with the present situation in Australia. And it effectively involved every adult, and I won't define whether that was from 18 or 21, but basically every adult getting $9,000 a year as universal basic income and paying 30% tax on everything they earn, no matter how little or how much so that at $30,000 of earned income, they're effectively equal. They were, they, were, they were receiving as much as they were paying in tax. Above 30,000, they were facing a 30% tax rate. Below 30,000, facing a 30% tax rate. 30% tax rate was the tax rate right through the entire system. 
that that, it seemed to me, would have a major impact on making it worthwhile for people getting off a benefit, which well, right now it simply is not worthwhile getting off a benefit. The tax rate people face trying to do so is just too tough. Logically, you'd scrap other benefits. Logically, you'd scrap the minimum wage. Because one of the real problems is some people are simply don't have the skill to employ at 16 bucks an hour. So an employer says, look, you can't read. I, there's nothing I can give you to do at 16 bucks an hour. So they remain unemployed. And I think being unemployed is arguably the worst and most demoralizing thing we foist on people. Somehow we have to deal with unemployment. We have to deal with welfare dependency. And I think a universal basic income is the best way of doing it. Thank you very much. Just here talking to my mate Rochelle about what her life was like as a single mum on the benefit uh, 25 years ago. Hi Rochelle. Um, it was it was hard. It was um, challenging. Uh, I worked part time cleaning for um, three hours a week, three days a week, um, just to try and put extra money on the table. But it didn't work out that way, and um, show that I was working. Um, even though my daughter was a baby and that I still wanted to contribute to society. Um, by the time I paid secondary tax and um, my DPB was adjusted uh, and the adjustment of the, the childcare subsidy, um, it, it worked out 30 cents an hour that I was working for. 30 cents an hour? Yeah. Waste of your time. Yep, and the only, I just had to carry on yeah. doing it, knowing that when my daughter was at school, at least on my CV, when I went to go and yeah. find a job yeah. um, with more hours or, yeah. you know, whatever, that um, I hadn't sat on my bum. Yeah. And how would a universal basic income of 250 bucks a week plus $40 a week for your daughter have helped, do you think? that you got to keep your money when you went to work? It would have changed our life. Um, I couldn't afford a car. We walked everywhere. Um, when I went to work for three hours on those three days, we walked from one suburb to the next where she was in childcare. And then I walked to another suburb to work. To work. So we would leave at eight o'clock in the morning and we would be home at 4.30. Mm. Um, all for 30 cents an hour. All for 30 cents an hour for three hours. Mm. Um, we would have been able to catch the bus when mm. it was raining. Mm. We might have been able to have a little car. Mm. You might have been able to... I might have been able to study. Study. Yeah, if there's something else that you wanted to do. Which I didn't have the opportunity no. to do. And I w didn't want the emotional pressure of having a student mm. loan. Mm. But knowing, if I'd have known that I had that income yeah. um, but you wouldn't lose it no matter what you did you would have had it forever it would have changed our lives changed would have changed, it would have changed both of our lives but it would have changed my career yeah. and um, everything about my life yeah. and I never thought of it like that I've always thought of the universal income as how it affects everybody else but yeah. to think how it would have affected actually me Personally, is really um, ending my life. Well, you did well, mate. <laughs> still here. Still here. <laughs> we're, we're both still here. Yeah. Well done, us. Thanks, Rochelle. Thank you. So Keith and Don, thank you so much for setting the scene and setting some of the background of these issues with our current welfare system and ideas for how we can 
fix it. I would now like to invite our third and final speaker for this evening, you might know him, Jeff Simmons, our leader, uh, economist of over 25 years. He worked as an economist at Treasury and then over in England before he came back and started working at the Morgan Foundation, which is how we have him with us today. Uh, so Jeff, welcome up. Still got a little bit of a tear in my eye after that, uh, that last presentation. So um, we're just going to uh, briefly cover the, um, the UBI proposal that, that TOP is putting forward and, uh, and then we'll have time for your questions and you know time for questions for uh, Don and for Keith as well if you, uh, if you have those. So by all means store them up uh, and I think we might have another video after me as well, do we? Yes, we do. Okay. So have we got um, the slideshow up here? Just to um, reinforce a lot of the points that, that Don and Keith have raised. I mean, just spend a moment thinking now, if you had $250 a week guaranteed, what would you do differently? Would you start a business? Would you, would you study? Would you have studied longer in the past? Would you spend more time with your kids? Or again, would you have done that in, in the past? Just allow yourself a moment to daydream about what you might have done differently in the past or, or what you might do differently now. If you did have that guaranteed source of income, that public dividend that Keith talked about, which I really like that framing, um, you may have seen Andrew Yang's campaign in the United States. He called it a freedom dividend, which is a little bit of a Superman slogan, but um, you know, truth, justice, and the American way. But but it it really is uh, you know um, thinking about it in, the, in those those dividend terms. I think is is quite useful. So uh, so this is the uh, this is our proposal. Um, I'm just going to move back so that people can see it. So. As Shai said at the start, $250 per week for every adult, $40 per child. And that, no, that has no conditions, so doesn't involve going to wins at all. And I think um, <coughs> a lot of New Zealanders don't realise what wins is like, uh, but we will hear a little bit more about that in the, in, in the final video that we're going to, to play. Um, but I think, you know, when the COVID subsidies run out in September, I think a lot of Kiwis, are, a lot of middle New Zealand is going to find out what it's like going into winds, and it's not a pleasant experience. Um, and really, the key thing, as, as Don talked about, um, is, is removing those barriers to work for people on, on welfare. That is, you know, one of the most pernicious issues that we have in our society, that welfare trap that our current welfare system is so failing our poorest people because it traps them in poverty. And we've got a graph which shows that issue. Um, this is the best case scenario welfare trap, okay, because it's a single person, there's no kids involved here, as Don mentioned, it gets worse if you add on accommodation supplement or children or uh, any other aspects of our welfare system. So this is just someone on the minimum wage on a job seeker benefit. And you can see that once they work more than five hours, they're working for the next 20 hours for roughly between two and four dollars an hour. And when you think about, as, you know, as the last video talked about, all of the costs of going to work and having to travel and you know have all the the, the um, gear child care all of those things that you need when you are when you are spending time at work it very quickly becomes pointless during that phase and then you really have to get out past 26 27 hours before work starts to pay now uh, you may have heard about the Greens GMI proposal, which uh, is more generous for beneficiaries, 
uh, but the impact of that is to make this welfare trap even larger. It's going to push the welfare trap out to about 36 hours per week. Again, just for the single job seeker before you take into account children and accommodation supplement. So someone is going to have to swing across this welfare trap. I think of it as a bit like an Indiana Jones movie, you know. Some, someone is going to have to take an almighty leap into the unknown and find full-time work from the benefit to be able to get over the welfare trap uh, with, that, with that Greens GMI proposal. So, and by contrast, this is what TOPS proposal looks like with a 33% tax rate. So the idea there really, you, you can see, is to make work pay to, as Keith set out, to give a basic amount of money that we can look after people with, but also to ensure that as they earn more, they can look after themselves. And we all know from evidence around the world that you know, the, the best way for people to get out of poverty and stay out of poverty is through work. You know, Don mentioned the mental health value of that as well, the feeling of purpose, all that sort of stuff. Um, but it is, it, it, you know, particularly from uh, an income perspective, benefits are never going to be enough for people to uh, live on. Uh, and of course, you know, there will be some people in society who can't work that we do have to look after. And, uh, and, and under our proposal, they wouldn't be any worse off. You know, we not, don't want to reduce uh, superannuation or, or benefits for people that really can't work. Um, but we do want to make work pay for those that can work. And you can see here the, the real winners from our proposal, uh, as, as Keith said, are those low-income workers. So people on full-time on the minimum wage are earning, they leapfrog the living wage. Now, I'm a, a big fan of the living wage. I think people should have enough to live on. But why is it that we expect businesses to pay that when the cause of the high cost of living in society is the cost of housing? <laughs> businesses did not cause that. They did not cause that problem. And, you know, of course, uh, we, you know, we want uh, people to get paid a, a fair amount for what, they, for what they do, but we have one of the highest minimum wages in the Western world. And so why should we punish businesses further for that really high cost of living, which comes from our obsession with the housing market? That is a whole different conversation that we don't want to get into. But, um, but with the UBI, people on the minimum wage are earning more than the living wage, and that, we think, uh, is fair. Now, with the flat tax rate, as Keith said, that benefit gets, um, that be benefit gets abated for higher income earners, so they're getting less of the benefit, uh, the additional benefit from that UBI. And in terms of how we're going to pay for this, if you want to move on, um, so the total cost is about 36 billion of our proposal. The, the majority of it gets paid for by the flat tax. Another chunk gets paid for by uh, just savings within the system. So for example, under a UBI, you don't need things like working for families, which is, working for families is, is an admission, really, that our, our, uh, our economy, our, uh, the wages in our economy can't cover the cost of living for families. So we already kind of have this admission out there that the current system isn't good enough. A big chunk of this is actually bureaucracy. So you think of all the bureaucrats in MSD and in IRD. I include IRD because we're talking about simplifying the tax system here too, folks all those bureaucrats out there that are, that are working, working out this complex system, making sure that people get what they deserve. And by the way, a lot of people don't get what they deserve under the current system because it's so bloody complex. That's why we have whole agencies out there that help beneficiaries filling out forms. <laughs> That's why we have 
some beneficiaries spending, you know, 30 hours a week just just working out, just getting the you know getting access to the uh, to the benefits that they are entitled to because it is so damn complex. So massive, massive savings in here. Now the last area, if you want to know the discrepancy between Keith's figures and ours, Keith's idea of 175 and ours of $250 per week. This is, this is where the, uh, the dynamic benefits of a universal basic income come in. Now when it's been trialled around the world, we see some quite big long-term impacts. People who are on the benefit are more likely to work. You understand that from everything we've talked about tonight, from what Don talked about. So we know that people who are on the benefit are more likely to work. The only people that are less likely to work are people who are training. And of course, if you're training, that means you're actually going to be earning more in the future. So again, tax revenue rises. And the only other people who work less are people who are staying at home raising their kids. And we know if you're staying at home raising your kids, those kids are going to go on to be more productive in society later on as well. So actually, on all those counts, it's a net investment for society and we see long-term dividends from that, again to use Keith's term, long-term dividends from that in terms of higher tax take for the government. Now, that we admit is speculative, it's never been tried on a society level before, it's only been done in small-scale experiments. But the small-scale experiments suggest the value of those, what we call dynamic benefits, are about $8 billion. If that doesn't materialise, we do have a property tax proposal to pick up that revenue if necessary. Uh, but we think uh, that, you know, that we can expect at least some of those dynamic benefits to come through uh, the system, particularly uh, immediately, I think, from the, from the training and from the working more. So that's how our UBI proposal works, as you can see. It's, it's, um, it's a simplification of tax and welfare and the improved incentives that come out of that really benefit everyone as a society. So I think that's my last slide. And I think uh, we're going to finish with a video. Oh, with Kane. And is the video first? Or no, no, no. OK. So Kane's coming on. Yes, so uh, we just got one more person wanting to uh, tell uh, their story in person and uh, Kane is one of our volunteers but he's also uh, a, a business person, an, an IT whiz and uh, has, a, you know, has a really good perspective on UBI and now I think we're finishing with a video, is that right? Yes. Uh, hi guys, yeah so my name's Kane, um, I am one of the IT managers for TOP, um, so Jeff asked me to sort of tell my story over the past couple of years. Um, I sort of struggled with deciding what to talk about, to be honest, uh, it's been quite a, quite a journey. Um, so my background obviously is IIT, I'm an IT engineer, I, before I met WINS I was on a good 80k a year sort of reasonably consistent, pretty happy, probably spent way more than I should have in town and supporting the hospitality industry. Um, and eventually I decided that I was going to sort of make something of my life and we moved down to Hamilton, me and my lovely partner over here. Um, unfortunately that it didn't quite work out. Uh, her health started to deteriorate pretty quickly. Um, so we moved back to Auckland. A part of that move down to Hamilton, the reason it's important is because we signed a, or I signed a fixed term contract with my employer at the time. That contract expired a month after we moved back to Auckland and my employer lost a bunch of clients at the same time. So uh, even though I was the most senior person on their help desk, I was the first on the chopping block. Um, because it was a fixed term contract, I didn't get much redundancy either, slash any redundancy. Um, used up most of our funds moving back to Auckland. Used up all my holiday leave moving back to Auckland. 
very, very quickly uh, we were on the dole key. Did everything we could to stay off it. I was working labour jobs, any job that I could find to try and keep myself out of it. But every time I worked, declare it to wins because I was working weekends and you've got to declare it to wins on a Friday and keep working on the Sunday and suddenly you get charged penalties because you're declaring the wrong amounts and you're trying to predict how much rain is going to happen over an Auckland winter weekend and yeah, you imagine how that went. So we really, really struggled for a long time and even after I started my business, managed to scrape together $100 for the, for the fee to, to register it. You know, it just carries on, it doesn't stop. They're always chasing you, and it only takes one mistake, and all of a sudden you fix it a couple of months later, and you realize that you're $1,000 in debt. And, uh, you know, it's just little mistakes. It doesn't take much, and uh, it, it gets you down. It beats you down. So, yeah, that's my story. We've just got one final video to play to you guys and then I'll open the floor up in case anybody has any questions for any of our speakers from tonight. I an email from a teacher aide. She didn't want us to use her name, so I'm going to read um, parts of what she said. This is what life looks like on a minimum wage with two part-time jobs as a single parent. My average weekly wage in hand is $580. This alters depending on work being available and some needs to be put aside to cover weeks when school is closed and teacher aides are not paid. I will do almost anything to avoid MSD. Dealing with them, my trauma response is so extreme. Even their name makes my stomach cramp and that sick sense of dread churns within. My heart beats faster. I can even feel that flush under the surface of my skin. I'm happy to starve, freeze, lose teeth, beg, borrow or hock, but not deal with them. So whatever I earn, that's it. Food is a shared commodity in my household, as in several households. If someone runs out of food, they usually end up at our place and we top them up till payday or out of our cupboards and pockets. I'm just including this bit because it kind of broke my heart a little bit. Work dues. It's impossible for people on a real income to comprehend that those of us on a minimum wage don't want to spend $45 at Christmas on a meal when we're looking down the barrel of 10 weeks with no pay. You don't get it. And it's awful hiding how you feel when staff invite you to stuff you can't afford to go to. No money for petrol, food, drinks, they stop asking and take it personally when, reality, when in reality it would be brilliant. The kicker for me is shared medicines. Until recently we passed our nebulizer around the whole family from household to household and yes, it was a crisis when it gave up the ghost. We bought a good one for my sister who needed it most just before lockdown. MSD is that place you go to when you're completely out of options. So when they turn you down, it's brutal. That sick desperation of not knowing what to do or how to cope is not something forgotten, forgiven or gotten over easily, especially when you know you'll have to go back and try again. This year, at age 58, I will have been debt free for one whole year. For the first time in decades, I was able to have an actual interest one I could spend time and money on. I took a course at the Learning Connection, just a term. What a high, I loved it. I would love to do it again. We'll see. I'm not very brave with money. The reason that we wanted to share these personal stories is because we can have these academic debates all night long, 
But at the end of the day, what we're talking about affects real people in our society. And our current system does not work, is fundamentally broken. And we have a real chance this year to do something different, to try and fix what isn't working. That is why TOP wants to really put a UBI front and centre of our campaign, because we know we can do better for our people. We know the answers. It's up to us to actually vote for it. So that's my piece. Um, I would like to open the floor in case anybody does have any questions at all. Uh, just let me know. <laughs> Uh, so the question was, yeah, thanks. So the question was, uh, obviously a move to a flat tax of 33% sends kind of shockwaves to people. Their initial reaction is that that sounds like a terrible idea and especially for those on the lowest wage. So that was the question, how do we deal with explaining uh, this new proposal to those especially on the lowest wages? Yeah, I think, I think that, you know, well we have a, a, a UBI calculator which someone can remind me of the um, ubi.top.org.nz. Yes. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's an education campaign really to, to 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 get across to people. And I know, I totally know what you mean when 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 you say people are going to be paying 33 cents on every dollar. Um, they then freak out, but they don't realise that they are, f you know, most uh, you know particularly people on low incomes are far more than compensated by that, by the $250 per week. So I think people just have to see that in, in action and, and you know, understand that, that difference, um, understand the, the, the total difference it would make to their, to their income. Um, so yeah, I mean, these sorts of conversations do, do take time, but it's, uh, it really is, that's why we're really pushing that the UBI is for the working poor, uh, so that people really do understand that. The other thing I think we have to get across in terms of households, because the average Kiwi household has 1.5 earners, if you know what I mean. Like the average Kiwi household has one person earning the average wage and one person earning the part-time average wage. Now that you know, that's on average. Some people have two earners in a household, some people only have one. Um, and so those, those sorts of um, households would really benefit from a UBI too because of, the, of course, the person who isn't working is often, as has been described by, by Keith and Don, are penalised by the current system uh, because we have this 1970s view of relationships that <laughs> you know everyone's partnered for life and uh, you know that's just not the the reality anymore um, so I think recognizing that by giving everyone that their own individual um, basic income is is, a, is a, a massive step forward and would help most households because one of those in a lot of households only one person's working Oh, sorry. To comment on that, at the, at the moment, really, um, we talk about our incomes and then we say we pay 33% or 30% or 25% tax, but the, the gross income is actually a convenient fiction. It's, um, and once you have a, a flat tax of 30 or 33%, then we'll actually stop even talking about gross income. It's pointless. It's only a, a convenient fiction because the way the income tax system has evolved over the last 100 years, um, in order to calculate everything, we have to have this construct called gross, gross income. But um, if you just think of it for someone now, if you're earning 70,000, you pay, um, uh, officially you pay 20% tax, or so, it's about 20% and that's it. Um, if you, um, 
of paying 33% tax and then get your basic income back. It's exactly the same. If you're currently officially earning $30,000, $40,000 a year gross, um, you can say, right, you're, you're paying about 15% tax because that's how it works out um, once you work out all the different discounts. But the more, um, the way I want people to think is that they're actually paying 33% tax and then getting something back. But what you get back is too little if you're earning 30000 or 40000 a year. But the reality is that, um, that um, but the tax rate is 33% now, and it's a, it's a tax on production because it's the, um, it's the um, reflection of all of the public resources that goes into our market economy. And, there's, um, and we, we just pretend we pay less tax than we really do now. That, that's it. But um, definitely, um, if you're earning any, anything under 70000 now, you, um, you you get the full amount back and not part of the amount back. That's it. Oh, yes. It's a great question. So why, since it's such a good idea that works, why haven't any other political parties in the past, <laughs> not looking just at you, Don, but why, but perhaps you want to start with this? Well, I, I uh, had this John Humphreys idea, as I say, when I was leader of the National Party. I thought it was fantastic. When my colleagues heard me talking about it, they freaked out. Because to make it work, you scrap other welfare benefits. What? The National Party can scrap out the benefits. And ideally, you scrap the minimum wage. What? You kill the National Party. My colleagues were just freaked out completely. They didn't talk about it again. So unless you describe it very simply, and Keith, with respect, it sounded hugely complex to me listening to you. You've got to say at 33000 whatever figure it is, you pay no tax at all. In fact, you get something back from the tax man. Zero. After that, you're paying 33. It would be very, very simple to get it across to the public at large. But Jeff, can I also make one other point? One of the reasons why people are having a hell of a time in New Zealand is the thing you touched on but didn't want to go into, the price of housing. Absolutely nuts in this country, and particularly in Auckland. How someone on the average wave lives in a house, I have no idea. Most of them can't afford one. And, and I, I have no rental property except a tiny house on an orchard, but very small. The people living in that place are paying what I think is somewhat below market rental. When they reach retirement, what the hell will they do? They cannot live on New Zealand super and pay even that relatively modest rent. Rents are crazy in Auckland, house prices are crazy, and the, the tragedy is both the major political parties know the solution. Bill English knew it. Phil Twyford knew it. It had nothing to do with 100,000 Kiwi bought houses. Right. And if maybe if I just touch on really briefly overseas, because you did ask what's going on in Scandinavia. And in Finland, they did recently do a trial. Uh, some people might have heard about it. It was a really small one though, so only 2,000 people were in the trial group. And so, arguably you could say that was too small of a group to get real results, but nevertheless, some of, their, some of the results that they did tell us about are pretty stark. So, talking about mental health, for example, depression dropped by a third, 33%. Uh, Working days increased by six days, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it was a significant result. Uh, so I don't know what's happening there, if, if they, they have any conversations about taking it nationwide or taking it outside of that trial, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, it's a good question why other countries aren't doing it on a nationwide level. And to be honest, if, if New Zealand was the first country that would fit with who we think we are, 
We think that we are the innovators. We think that we lead the world in so many things. So why on earth would we not start to lead the world in our welfare and tax system? That is correct. That is correct. So the Cam was talking about the fact that effectively at $39,000, it's tax zero. So you work for $39,000, you keep $39,000 with the UBI and the flat tax, and your partner who isn't working keeps the full $13,000. So yes, $52,000 in aggregate. You may have uh, heard that our finance minister, Grant Robertson, uh, wanted to do a UBI trial. I, and I can't work out for the life of me what happened to that um, because he, he was talking about it in the future of work stuff um, before he was elected. Um, so I would imagine that that is the ideal place to start in terms of you know, showing the benefits of, of such a such a system, it'd be great to you know um, do something in a in a community that can actually show the the, the community wide benefits. I think um, so Kaitaia, yeah, 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 something something like that. And and I do and I do think um, you know uh, it it really does encourage communities to to, to work together and and pull resources as well, um, which. Know some cultures in New Zealand have, uh, a, a, you know, a rich history of. So I mean, I think um, a, a, a trial is the is the obvious place to start, and uh, you know, once people see the, the the full benefits, we will will go from there. But just to go back to the the previous question and kind of link it to this question, I mean, when you look at, I mean, Shai was talking about, you know, uh, New Zealand seeing itself as an innovative nation. The welfare state was created in the Great Depression, really, uh, and New Zealand was one of the innovators, if, if not the innovator. Um, and it, so it is times like this, this current crisis that we are facing that, that do give an opportunity for, for people to do things differently. Uh, and, I, and I do think that, as I mentioned uh, you know, earlier, that once the COVID wage subsidies run out and a lot of people start, you know, a lot more people have to start interacting with WINS, then I think, uh, you know, I, I think this could become a real conversation. In terms of the 1930s, um, the uh, first Labour government in the 1930s, they, when they won in 1935, it wasn't as big a landslide as a lot of people thought. Um, because the um, conservative vote was split because there was a breakaway party, the Democratic Party. Uh, but Labour got in by a promising universal welfare because the Great Depression, a lot of the stories we've had today, they were even worse then. The way that people got help during the Great Depression it was, it was appalling, the uh, things that people, the bureaucracy and the uh, poverty traps and the begging, if you like, of uh, charities and, and the rules around getting help and relief and so on was really, really tough. So firstly, the promise of a, a universal approach was what got Labour over the line in 1935. But by the end of 1937, Labour wasn't 
ahead in the polls, if you like. So Labour could have lost in 1938. Um, and what was happening is that they, they were reneging on, the, on their promise. And so the left of the Labour Party was trying to go for a big redistributive option of significant tax rises for the rich and quite high benefits. It was a very redistributive model. So a little bit like what the Greens are talking about now. So soak the rich, pay high benefits to the poor, but you always have that middle is the big problem that we're dealing with now. And um, it, it went down pretty well with the far left, but not really too many others. Now the right wing of the Labour Party, they, they were going for a social insurance model. So they were wanting to break their promise as well. And that was one where you put in uh, your contributions, hope, hope for compound interest, and there'd be all these big wonderful benefits down the track in the future. It didn't help women at all, it didn't help a lot of people, but it meant that higher income uh, workers would get more in the future, but it was based on these very actuarial insurance principles. And in the end, it was Savage who wasn't really committed to any particular group in the, um, in the uh, caucus um, could see that they were losing popularity, and they went back to their original proposal, scrapped the redistribution, scrapped the social insurance, and just came up with a, a, a basic universal welfare state, and the thing that really clinched it was the promise of a universal superannuation. And when it came in in 1940, it was at a very, quite a low level, but it was sort of staircase so that it would rise after that, but it was that idea that there was a universal superannuation for everybody unconditionally. And the result was that Labour won the 1938 election in about the biggest landslide in our history. But, um, beginning of 1938, they were looking like they could lose. So, and then people say, who was the greatest New Zealander of the 20th century? Many people say it was Michael Joseph Savage. And he was the one who was able to cut through the political nonsense that was going on, see what the people wanted, and have something that brought them together. Okay, so uh, different people might say uh, different things, but I think um, uh, Jeff has, has said that we, that shouldn't really change. But what we should note is that um, New Zealand superannuation, as it's called now, is a UBI. It's, it's a taxable UBI, but it's a UBI just that you're 65 instead of 18. So in, in effect, at the moment, people earning more than $70,000 who are over 65 actually can get two UBIs because at the moment, um, if you're earning more than $70,000, you pay 33 and you get 175 back, plus you get your New Zealand super. Now, um, there is, uh, by taking the approach that uh, I will take, for example, that if, uh, your New Zealand super, the first part of that is um, your UBI any, anyway, so you wouldn't get the full super plus a full UBI but you would certainly get an amount that would be $150, $170, dollars on top of your UBI, and that would be your super. So in other words, someone who's getting super today, that would be split in two. Part of it would be the UBI that everybody gets, and part of it would be the super that you have to be 65 to get. No, I'm not a member of the top... Uh, but that's the, uh, that's my answer to your question. <laughs> so, actually, we increase super a little bit because we are bringing in the 33% flat tax, which also would apply to anyone 65 and over and working. So their super will not go down, but they will be affected by the 33, and that's how we adjust it by increasing the super by 800 a year. I think it's about 809 a year. Yeah, I mean, but basically anyone on superannuation, just on superannuation, is, is no worse off. And uh, what we're effectively doing with the flat tax rate is uh, you know, bringing in a surcharge on, higher, on, on people who are earning, who, are earning su who have their super and are also earning an income. So that is what effectively will make our superannuation system sustainable while 
uh, so we don't have to increase the age. Because uh, you know, you can, w one option to make superannuation sustainable is to increase the age, but that is you know, unfair for people who are manual workers. So what we're suggesting is with the 33% flat tax, you're, you're adjusted if you're on NZ super, so you're slightly better off. Um, but if you're earning while you're still receiving your super, you'll be paying slightly more tax. So it makes, it makes the system uh, sustainable longer term. Yeah. No problem. Any other, any other questions? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. last, last one, yeah. Oh yes, so the question is, uh, um, the questioner is asking whether with a UBI there'll need to be a moral police looking through the curtains of bedrooms to work out who is sleeping with who. It's a joke, but actually this is an incredibly serious issue because um, I can't remember the figure, but if you're, if you're on, a, on a benefit and you see someone for longer than, I think it's like six weeks, Yeah, yeah, uh, but I mean, in, in, in the most extreme form, uh, you know, you, you can be with someone in a pretty casual relationship and Wins decides that, that you should, you know, that, that you guys should be uh, sharing your income effectively. If, if one of them is working, then therefore you should lose your benefit. Now, like I was saying before, in the modern society where relationships are a little more fluid than they were in the 1970s, it's a completely absurd uh, concept that that, that that happens. But it, it does happen an awful lot um, and is, is probably the most punitive aspect of our welfare system. So yes, the thought of having an MSD officer twitching and looking through your curtains is somewhat amusing but also in a uh, you know, is is in a quite dark Orwellian kind of way, the the most you know real and scary image of the current system and its impact on on ordinary people. Um, which which you completely avoid with the UBI. <laughs> it's worth saying. Yes. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> for making me point that out. Um, and just one thing I want to say in, in, in closing, because the reason we wanted to do this event and present views from, from really a, across the political spectrum, uh, and, and, and I want to acknowledge uh, Sue Bradford, she, she was uh, intending on coming along tonight but wasn't able to make it, which is a shame. She's a, an, another big uh, UBI advocate. And, you know, the kind of conversation we want to see in New Zealand is where the the left are arguing for a higher UBI and a higher flat tax rate, and the right are arguing for a lower UBI and a lower flat tax rate. Wouldn't that be a wonderful political debate to have, you know? <laughs> because what we just want to get in place is a UBI, and people can then see the benefits of getting rid of this welfare trap, of, of encouraging people to, to follow their dreams, follow their aspirations, start businesses, train, all that sort of stuff that they want to do. We want to unleash all of those possibilities. And, you know, as I was saying before, we start to see those dynamic benefits through reduced bureaucracy, through, you know, greater tax revenue because people are, are, are working more and training more. We want to unleash all that stuff and then we can have a then we can argue until the cows come home you know uh, between the right and the left about whether we have a higher ubi and a higher tax or you know what i mean like that we think would be a, a, a marvelous and rich debate to have for the next 100 years but we've got to make this step change and get a ubi in to be in a position to be able to have that conversation um, so do you want to wrap up we're kind of freewheeling here, aren't we? <laughs> I just really want to thank our speakers tonight, Don Brash, Keith Rankin, 
uh, Kane, and of course uh, Cam, for, Cam, our local candidate for opening tonight, and Shy, uh, who, who ran the event. Big round of applause for everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. Keep the conversation going, and uh, this will all this is all, this is all on Facebook now, isn't it? By the way, live. So uh, check it out when you get home. You can watch it all again. <laughs> Kia ora.